Hi folks, today I'm going to talk you through the seven steps it takes for a new drug to get from the lab all the way to patients. Knowing these seven steps will not only give you a better understanding of how new drugs are developed, but it would also give you the exact context why developing new drugs is so expensive. Before we dive in, let me give you a benchmark of what I mean by expensive. According to a recently conducted systematic literature search, the cost for developing a new drug range anywhere between 160 million and four and a half billion US dollars. I know these numbers sound absolutely crazy, but let's go through the seven steps to explore where these astronomical costs come from. Jumping right in, our first step begins in the lab where scientists are looking for new ways to treat diseases. To successfully treat a disease, we first need to discover potential candidates for our new drug. But how do we do that? Before answering this question of how drug discovery works today, we first need to distinguish two different types of drug discovery. For the longest time, humankind relied on what can be described as serendipitous or unplanned or fortunate drug discovery, which is the first type of drug discovery. A great example of such fortunate drug discovery is Sir Alexander Fleming's discovery of the first antibiotic in 1928. One day, the Scottish physician and microbiologist returned from holiday to find mould growing on a petri dish of bacteria. What he noticed from his coincidental observation was that the mould seemed to be preventing the bacteria from growing around it. Following his observation, he soon identified that the mould produced a self-defense chemical that would kill the bacteria. It was due to this lucky finding of a single researcher which gave us the first treatment for bacterial infections more than 90 years ago. Such serendipitous discoveries naturally still occur even today, but science has evolved since the 1930s, which brings me to the second type of drug discovery. This second type of drug discovery is what I'd like to call intentional or planned discovery, which is the type of drug discovery that is used by pharma companies today. The way this planned discovery works can be broken down into three simple stages. In the first stage, scientists identify biological molecules such as proteins that are involved in a disease process that can potentially be targeted by a drug. Once these biological targets are identified, Researchers will then validate that modulating this target will have a therapeutic effect on the disease. In the second stage, thousands and thousands of chemical compounds are tested to see if they interact with the biological target that was identified in stage one, using techniques like high throughput screening, computer models and lately even artificial intelligence to predict which compounds are likely to bind to the biological target. At the end of stage two, promising compounds, which are sometimes also referred to as hits, are identified. In the third and last stage, promising hit compounds are further tested and optimized to improve their efficacy, selectivity and safety which will result in so-called lead compounds, which again are modified even further to enhance their chemical properties. After these lead compounds are fully optimized at the end of stage three of the drug discovery phase, we can then move on to the next step of the drug development process. The second step of the drug development process is preclinical research. In preclinical research, the goal is to assess the toxicity of the lead compounds identified in step one. Like drug discovery, preclinical research is conducted in the lab, whereby two different types of preclinical research or experiments are generally distinguished. The first type of preclinical research leverages so-called in vitro experiments, which refers to experiments conducted in the lab. In the lab, researchers will do tests with microorganisms, cells or biological molecules outside their normal biological context using test tubes, chemical flasks or petri dishes. This also explains why the Latin term in vitro is used to describe such experiments as it translates to in the class. 
The second type of preclinical research uses in vivo experiments. The term in vivo is Latin and translates to in the living, which hints to the distinction to the aforementioned in vitro experiments. In the context of preclinical research, in vivo experiments are animal studies, which commonly use animals like mice, rats, rabbits, or even larger animals like dogs or pigs. The goal of such in vivo studies in animals is to assess the safety, appropriate dosage range, pharmacokinetics and tolerability of our lead compounds. This is done in animals first to ideally prevent or at least minimize severe adverse effects from occurring in humans. Once preclinical research has demonstrated that the target compound is fundamentally safe in animals, clinical research is then needed to assess how the new drug interacts with the human body. As such, clinical research refers to studies or trials that are done in people, whereby three types of clinical studies are typically distinguished. These three types of clinical studies include phase one, phase two and phase three trials. The goal of a phase one trial is the determination of the most common side effects and the assessment of the drug's metabolization in a small cohort of healthy volunteers. Phase one trials are also conducted to find the range of a safe dosages for patients by applying various statistical approaches. These phase one trials are often limited in sample size frequently having less than 100 participants. If phase one trials don't reveal unacceptable toxicity, phase two trials follow to obtain preliminary efficacy data for the new drug to prove that it works in sick patients with a specific disease. In case of a controlled phase two trial, the new drug is usually compared against a placebo treatment. Phase two trials are generally much bigger compared to phase one trials, but commonly they're still having less than 300 participants. These phase two trials further help to decide if the new drug should proceed to the even larger and even more expensive phase three trials. If the phase two trials are successful, phase three trials will follow, whereby the main goal of phase three trials is to analyze the effectiveness of a new drug versus the standard care in a preferably randomized trial setting. Before these phase three trials commence, the pharma company will get together with a regulatory body like the FDA or EMA, for example, to discuss the trial, whereby aspects of the clinical trial like the required target population size of the study are then further defined. This is done as the scale of a trial will determine the likelihood by which an unknown parameter can be successfully estimated. Therefore, sample size calculations are conducted to determine the required scale of the trial, which provides enough samples to detect significant changes in clinical parameters or treatment effects. As a general rule of thumb, the sample size needs to be bigger to observe less frequent events, while more frequent events will require smaller sample sizes. The appropriate sample size can vary vastly from study to study, ranging anywhere from several hundred patients to several thousands. Once the appropriate sample size is then determined, recruitment for the phase three trial will start and the trial will run for a predefined study duration. Once the phase three trial concludes, scientists will analyze and publish its findings before moving to the next step in the drug development process. This next step is the regulatory review and approval of our new drug. Regulatory requirements can vary from country to country and pharma companies need to seek separate regulatory approval in each country they want their drug to be available in, assuming there are no mutual recognition procedures in place. Some geographic regions also have one regulatory body that can be used to gain approval for all included countries like the European Medicines Agency or EMA in Europe. Most pharma companies file for regulatory approval in the US first though, as the US represents by far the biggest pharmaceutical market in the world. 
The data you see here in this graph shows the top 10 pharma markets by drug sales according to a report from IQVIA, which I will link to in the video description down below. As you can see from this graph, pharmaceutical sales for the US in 2020 were over 500 billion US dollars. To put this into perspective a little bit better, this is roughly equivalent to the total GDP of Sweden. I know, that's crazy. Alternatively, you could also buy just over four large pizzas for every person living on this planet with the amount of money. Given the size of the US drug market, pharma companies tend to file for regulatory approval in the US first. To gain approval in the US, companies will submit an investigational new drug application, or IND for short, to the FDA with the hope of ultimately gaining marketing authorization for the new drug. This marketing authorization is basically a stamp of approval, certifying that the drug is safe and effective, thus giving patients confidence to trust that the medicine does what it's supposed to do. Once our new drug has received its marketing authorization, it's technically ready to be used in patients. I will explain why this isn't the full truth in a moment, but before doing so, I wanted to come back to the promise I made earlier in this video. I promised that you would better understand why new drugs are so expensive, but so far we haven't really touched on that aspect. I've already mentioned that developing new drugs can cost billions of dollars, but where does this enormous cost actually come from? We get a better understanding of where these costs come from when we look at a graph that plots the costs of drug development over time based on the four steps we've discussed so far in this video. I've taken and adapted this graph from a paper written by Sun et al, which got published in a peer review journal in 2022. And you can download their full paper via the link in the video description. As you can see from this graph, a lot of drug development fails. Pharma companies need to screen tens of thousands of potential compounds to get down to a few hundred potential leads. The most successful leads will then go through preclinical testing, where they need to pass in vitro and in vivo experiments to move to the clinical phase one, two, and three studies. And as you can see, pharma companies will run multiple clinical studies in parallel, and not all of them will succeed. Even phase three trials still fail to meet expectations regularly, with over 40% of all phase three trials being unsuccessful. Remember that at this point in time, pharma companies have invested years and years of time and effort into developing these drugs, only to then find out that their phase three results are negative. This high failure rate and the long time it takes companies to run these studies is what explains the high cost. In other words, the cost of a new drug includes the cost of all failed attempts at drug development leading up to this point, with only one successful candidate remaining at the very end. On top of that, pharma companies only have a limited time once their drug is approved, during which they can sell their drug without worrying about any kind of generic competition in the market. This generic competition usually enters the market as soon as the patent expires. Standard patent duration from filing is 20 years, whereby half of the time can easily be taken away by the time it takes the company to develop their drug. Therefore, pharma companies typically have about 10 years to generate revenue to make up their massive initial investment. Now that we know why new drugs can be so expensive, let me go back to explaining how drugs get from the lab all the way to the patient. I've already mentioned how our new drug has received a positive marketing authorization in step four. What follows after a positive marketing authorization is what's called post-marketing surveillance. This post-marketing surveillance represents step five of the drug development process. In step five of the process, pharma companies run phase four studies to monitor a drug's long-term effectiveness identify any rare or long-term side effects, 
and ensure that drugs continues safety and efficacy in the general population. The focus hereby is on the long-term outcome of the trial, which are collected to make sure that the drug remains safe and effective throughout the entire life cycle. Pharmacovigilance is another important term to be familiar with in the context of post-marketing surveillance, given that it involves monitoring the use of medicines in everyday practice to identify previously unrecognized adverse effects or changes in the patterns of adverse effects. The distinction to phase four trials is that pharmacovigilance activities can be broader in scope and don't necessarily follow the structured approach of a clinical phase four trial. Before we start talking about step six in the drug development process, we need to jump back to the point where pharma companies receive marketing authorization, which I explained in step four. You'll remember that I've mentioned that pharma companies can theoretically sell their drugs once they've received a positive marketing authorization for their product. The emphasis here is on theoretically, as pharma companies practically still need to go through a reimbursement process in step six. In practice, someone needs to pay for the new drug that come to the market, which is why obtaining national reimbursement is so important. The way in which pharma companies can achieve national reimbursement varies from country to country, but in most markets, it's essential to tap into these public health insurance systems to receive funding for the new drug outside of privately negotiated arrangements. The process which leads to reimbursement in many countries is called health technology assessment or HDA for short, which ultimately aims to derive an appropriate price for new drugs. I won't be covering it here, but if you're interested in finding out how health economists set the price for new drugs in cost-effectiveness driven HDA markets, then I'll recommend you check out my video on the topic, which you can find here. Crucially, pharma companies can still fail to obtain reimbursement in some markets, even after receiving positive marketing authorization. For example, should their drug not be cost-effective or if HDA agencies and payers do not see enough added value in the product. This adds another layer of potential failure and therefore acts as a risk factor that will ultimately be reflected in the overall costs of the new drug. Let's assume though that our drug that we followed all the way from the lab doesn't fall victim to that unfortunate fate in step six and instead gets reimbursed by our local payers. Once our new drug is reimbursed, pharma companies will then start generating revenue as patients gain access to the new medicine in step seven. Step seven is the step that we are all very familiar with. We get sick, so we go and see our GP or specialist and they'll prescribe us the new drug. We'll then take that prescription to the pharmacy and can take the new drug home with us. In severe cases, we might go straight to the hospital where we'll receive immediate care with our new drug. In many countries around the world, we only need to pay very little or no money at all to receive those drugs, given that the vast majority of the costs is already covered by universal healthcare systems that provide universal access to medicines to everyone who needs them the most. And that's it. Those are the seven steps it takes to bring a new medicine all the way from initial drug discovery in the lab into the hands of patients that need them. If you've liked this video and you want to see more content like this, please consider subscribing and hit the notification bell so that you don't miss out on my latest videos. Here on YouTube, I share everything I know about health economics with the aim of making the subject more accessible to people. I'll cover a variety of topics all from the perspective of a former consultant who's worked in the pharmaceutical industry for years. If that's what you're looking for here on YouTube, then you came to the right place and I'll see you in the next video.